Hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2, second channel video. Sorry for the shaky camera. This is the IBM 5170 that I've been working on, donated by patron Justin. I'm still working on this machine, so slow going, working on it little by little, but when I have a chance. But I think I mentioned in maybe part one that I have some other machines that Justin dropped off that I want to take a quick look at. And these are all XT class machines. So I don't think anything is going to be super interesting on these, but you never know. But I thought as a second channel video, at least I could take a look at one of these, maybe more if they're boring. Maybe there'll be more of these videos, not just the one. Who knows? Anyhow, let me grab the first one here, which is the one that's closest to me. There's also some random boards. Um, not all of those were inside the machine, I think. A couple of these are from, these two at least, are from the 5170, the AT. But I think those two came in these machines and they were just loose. So I stuck them up there. So I'm going to grab this first machine right here and bring it onto the bench. I guess first let's start with these boards that were just sitting on the top of the machine. So this first one here is very obviously a monochrome video card. It's got a nine pin and a parallel port on here. It has a whopping 64K of RAM, which is quite generous to be honest. Let's see if I can find a date code, 86 40th week. So that's as much RAM as a Commodore 64 has, but this is almost certainly like a Hercules compatible type card. So relatively boring compared to what a Commodore 64 can do. Um, I'll test some of these out well, we'll see if one of the PCs even working, and I can pop these in and we can test them out. So that's the first board, video card. Second one here says, uh, what does this say? Peripheral Marketing Incorporated PMI. That's right here on this chip. Down here it says, what is it? Thesis Memory Products. Okay. FCC ID, Fast Card 4, made in Mexico. Got lots of interesting stuff on here. So, of course, we have a clock because there's a battery there. There is obviously RAM expansion, which is not populated, and there are two boards sandwiched together here. No RAM is installed on either part of it, so this doesn't actually add any RAM. Over here on this side, we have a serial port, parallel port, and we have an extra connector here, which it's not immediately obvious what that is. Now, what is surprising is, I mean, I assume under this PMI chip is an EEPROM, but there's definitely another EEPROM here. What exactly is that for? Because typically a card like this in an XT, of course it's an 8-bit ISA slot with RAM and serial ports and a clock, it doesn't have a BIOS, it doesn't need it. It's like this stuff is all just supported internally on the system. So what exactly do those do? So that'll be interesting to pop this into a computer and see what that does. And the next card is another video card. Well, I'm going to say, oh, this says color graphics with printer. Looking up close on the board, it's just plainly a regular CGA type card. There is a company name there, Thompson, Harriman, and Edwards. FCC ID is DXL91L. Interesting. So, like a Taiwanese clone video card, I guess. Nine pin for the video, parallel port. Monitor printer is actually labeled on there. It's dusty on the back. I am looking for the memory on here. Where is the RAM? Here it is. There is 16 kilobytes between these two chips right here. 41, uh, 44 16s. So 16K times four bits. I'm not seeing any other RAM. So this thing, I guess is a CGA card, but it's a relatively stingy one, which actually, if I go back to this one here, which doesn't say anything about what it is. Oh, I noticed here at the top, by the way, made in Japan. And there's a QC sticker. 
We actually have some Japanese written there as well. I wonder what that says. But 64K is quite a lot. Now, could this be Hercules compatible? Oh, this is actually SRAM right here too. A 6116 SRAM chip. So 64K with SRAM. What exactly is this? See, I don't think this is EGA. Definitely not EGA. It wouldn't have a parallel port. It would also have a ROM. This is just the character ROM right here. CRTC, the CRT controller chip, and the RAM. So curious, very curious about what this one is, if it's color or just monochrome. And this is the XT machine that I pointed to earlier. Remember, these are rescues, just like the 5170 was, found in an attic from what Justin said. And this is definitely some kind of an XT clone. Let me lift up the front. Oh, this is so heavy. All three of the machines that were on the ground there were missing their top covers. So they can't be really made into a complete machine, but at least some of the parts should be useful. So this machine has two 360K floppy drives. I'm assuming they're 360K and all signs would point to yes. It has a Seagate hard drive here, which is an ST225, 20 megabytes. And here's the XT clone motherboard, not an original IBM or anything like this. This probably had a top cover that looked like the original 5150 or 5160. Definitely the insides are slightly different, although it's similar, definitely similar. So I think this is 640K of RAM here. These are MT RAM chips, 1257-15, 150 nanoseconds. I'm assuming this is 512K. These are 64K chips, so that would be another 128K, which totals up to 640. Now, while you look down here, you notice all these slots for EEPROMs, and they're all empty, and you might think someone pillaged the EEPROMs. I don't think so. This was probably originally designed to use lower capacity EEPROMs, uh, just like the original 5150 and 5160 did, and later, or has a jumper to select a higher capacity, and I can see just down here, move this so we can maybe just make it out. There is actually an EEPROM right there. It's underneath the hard drive. Let me extricate some of these cards. This one is held in with like an IBM screw. I have to use a nut driver for that. Okay, let's start over here on the right. This card is the hard drive controller. Microtech Incorporated, BIOS version 3.2.1, copyright 1986, HDC 1000. And it has a very fancy looking ceramic package here from NEC, the D7261AD chip. Now, as for these hardware controllers, there is a BIOS on here because there's usually a program to do the low level formatting, set up the disc uh, to specific heads and cylinders, things like that. The next card is a floppy controller, and this is one of the old school ones. If this one is not made by IBM, it's a total clone. I mean, we're talking an exact clone with this edge connector here. It has the large connector on the back here for connecting external floppy drives. Oh, sorry, the uh, furnace is turning on. Well, it's not the furnace, it's the air conditioning due to the heat wave we're having here in Portland. Date codes I'm seeing on this thing are from around 84, but it says comp right here for the component side. I am really, really thinking, look at this number here, 6181682XM, very much an IBM part number. And on the back, there's a little picture of a palm tree there. So if anyone can recognize this as being the original IBM floppy controller, double density one, of course, yeah, let me know. And the final card here is obviously, oh dear, it's an I.O. card, but it has a clock on it, and it has leaked. Yowza. And unfortunately, it has leaked down into the slot connector on the motherboard, which I can see. Let me zoom in on that. It has very green and crusty in there. So that's not great, not great at all. If it hasn't leaked down and damaged this motherboard, then 
maybe with some cleaning, but I don't think that slot is ever going to work properly. I don't think I really would have assumed that this card with the serial parallel had a clock on it, and it was hidden under the ribbon cables. Of course, it's a Varda brand. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Varda. It's just, it's a NICAD, and they always leak. That's how it goes. And in case anyone was wondering, parallel, two serial ports and a game port, along with a real-time clock, CT6250. And there's some kind of a, a logo there. All right, and I'm just looking around on the motherboard here. It does say XT640K. Right down here on the edge, it says Bit Plus, Rev 2D there. Not a whole lot to say about this motherboard. There were tons and tons of clone XT motherboards. I mean, an immeasurable amount of them coming out of Taiwan. Most of them were unbranded. I think a lot of them just used copies of the IBM BIOS, like they weren't using one of the third-party ones. I'll be curious to power this up, to see if this is using an IBM copy or something original, like one from Phoenix or something like that. All right, well, I got this um, ISA diagnostic postcard. I'm just gonna stick that in here. Now, there's no postcodes on, on an XT BIOS like this, but the benefit of this card is it will give me a quick glance at these LEDs right here, which you can't really see but on the camera, but I can see them. And they'll turn on to say that the power rails are working. This thing could have shorted tantalums very easily. So um, yeah, okay, I think I'm just gonna plug in the mains power into this thing, make sure the power switch is off. We're just gonna see what happens. I mean, why not? Why don't I unplug the hard drive? Okay, unplug the hard drive. In fact, I'm gonna unplug the floppy drives too. If the power supply is bad and sends some ridiculous voltage, I don't want to damage these components, which may work. Okay, so here we go. Okay. Hey, the rails all look good. So I'm going to put a video card in this thing, and we're going to see if this thing actually works. I think this is a good excuse to use the handy-dandy 8-bit ISA video card, VGA card that is. So I can plug this right into my monitor here. Let's find a slot that works. The motherboard is very bendy. The mounting holes aren't perfect, so the card didn't really line up very well. I'm obviously gonna avoid the burned slot here, not use that one. But all right, here we go. Whoa, that was a loud beep. There it is, PC Turbo BIOS Error 4. Super nondescript. We have an XT compatible keyboard, which I will plug in now. Pretty amazing. This thing was just left for, left for dead. Control Alt Delete did work. Left for dead, and it's actually working with all of that battery corrosion into that slot. Ouch. Insert diskette in drive A. I'm not really recognizing the BIOS. It's definitely not an IBM. Not to say that it doesn't have a bunch of copied code in it though. Okay, in goes the hard drive. And let's plug in the floppy drives as well. In with the hard drive controller. I will not be putting this card back in, nope. And we'll pop this floppy controller in here. All right, now we're ready for some action. Here we go. Will this even turn on? Who knows? These might be have shorted tantalums on them as well. Our drive is spinning. All right. Microtech hard drive controller. Is that BIOS coming up? Such a loud beep. It's still giving me error number four. I pushed F1 and it's trying to boot off the floppy drive here. I'd say the hard drive is not happy. It doesn't appear to be trying to boot, so I'm just gonna pop this cleaning disc into the floppy drive and we'll see if we can boot some DOS on a 360K.
think the hard drive is kaput, which is really not surprising. It's trying to boot. MS DOS 3.3. Control delete again. I may have to just take the hard drive controller out. Doesn't appear to want to try to boot. Oh wait, look, it's actually, well, I think it's trying to go to the hard drive. All right, let's take this out. Let's see if the machine even boots first before I attempt to get the hard drive working. Wonder what that error four is. RAM error, maybe? So it's weird. It's not even trying to access the floppy anymore. I wonder why it stopped doing that. Could be the slot. Oh, you know what? I don't think the card was in all the way. Let's try that again. Okay, I heard it seek. The light's on. I can't feel if this is actually doing anything though. I don't see the drive head even moving. Disc is spinning, but that's it. Yeah, this apparently this doesn't seem to be working. And it's just sitting there. I think what I'm gonna do is completely take this machine apart now that it mostly is working and see if, you know, maybe it's just the disk drive. Actually, you know what, before we do that, just just in this dirty state, I'm gonna plug a known working drive, a known working floppy drive that is, into here. Here is a Tandon drive. Five and a quarter inch half height, 360K. Let's plug this in, see if this machine boots. Will it boot? Okay, I'm gonna put the disk drive on this mouse pad here. Let's put this DOS 3.3 disk in this drive. I can't believe how loud that is. Always error number four. Always an error number four. Insert disk in drive A. All right, back to my original plan. I think this thing just needs to be disassembled and then I can bench test this a little more easily outside of this heavy case. So I disassembled the machine and here's something kind of interesting. So these two five and a quarter inch floppy drives, they're attached together with these metal rods here, which screw into the sides of the drive and then it has mounting holes, which is what was screwed into the side of the case. So these drives were, on this computer were only held in by two screws on one side and then the drives were lashed together using these things. Kind of an interesting solution. And they did this because originally this case would have been designed for full height floppy drives. So this was a solution to get two drives on one side. And I guess you could do something similar potentially. So you could also use these on hard drives. So here's the Seagate. So if you had two Seagates, you could stack them on top of each other with this bar here, or I guess you could do one floppy drive, one Seagate. But if you notice, this is that second hole there, that's where it actually screwed into the case. And um, the hard drive already has those two holes. So if you ever wondered why there is a hole above this one on pretty much everything that you see these days, that is because those old XT cases, it used the upper screw. Now these drives, it's almost like they were designed for these things. Like they slot in and they're flush. They don't stick out. And I guess, I think if I tried to do it on the hard drive where it was sticking on the top, you wouldn't be able to slide it in the front of the case because here it's actually flush mount. I was able to slide this out while these were still attached. So yep, kind of neat. So these are Fuji disk drives, which um, I assume they're actually working. They're very dusty. This whole computer was obviously very well used. Yeah, look at this uh, line of dust here. Ooh. 
non-smoker machine though, no smell of cigarette smoke. So that is a good thing. I think everyone who regularly watches my channel will know I am not a fan of cigarette smoke. So these are pretty cool. I'm gonna keep these all together, the little flush uh, tapered screws with these brackets. So in case I ever need to do this stacking in an old case, I'll have these handy. Out of the case, I grabbed the speaker. I of course grabbed the motherboard, which is right here. This is a Turbo XT motherboard. I would not be surprised if this runs at like seven and some megahertz. And that's because every PC has this like 14 and change megahertz crystal. So it probably divides that by two and that runs the CPU. I do not see any connections for jumpers. Of course, there's the dip switch block here for configuration. And here's the connection for the speaker. So I guess there's no way to turn off the turbo on this motherboard. You can check out that slot. Not good, not good at all. See if this leaked through to the back. Didn't, seemingly no damage back here. So that slot itself is just ruined. Okay, we'll grab my old AT power supply here, just because I know that this thing works and plus it won't barf out a whole bunch of dust when I turn it on. And for floppy drive, we're gonna use the known good controller I have here, just in case that IBM looking one is somehow flaky. Okay, we're ready for power, here we go. So no speaker is connected, so we're not gonna hear that loud, horrible beep. We're still getting error number four. I really think that there's probably some kind of fault, probably bad RAM. This will probably be a future diagnostic video. Probably explains why it also doesn't boot. It's like it's not even causing the drive to seek. Oh, I am using one of the drives here that was in the case, which may be bad. Plugging in my known good drive, same exact problem. Okay, so I'm gonna say that this motherboard is somehow faulty. I mean, it obviously turns on, but it does not work the rest of the way. So why don't we test out the, le the rest of the components? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unplug this thing. I'm gonna give it a wash. I'm gonna put this under soapy water just to give it a clean. And I don't know, I'll put some Something in here, vinegar, I guess. Try to get some of that corrosion out. For further testing, we're gonna use this. A 46, I don't know, Cyrix 46 DX266 on a Visa local bus board, which has a damage slot as well. That's why I have tape over it. I would like to just validate that this drive does boot with DOS 3.3. So I'm gonna use the same setup I was just using so I can properly uh, isolate if this stuff is working, that way I could label that motherboard as having a problem. Here we go. I am gonna set the hard drive to none and 360K for the floppy drive. We'll just leave the data as whatever. And here we go, save and exit. Well, the drive seeked at least, which is more than I can say for what it was doing on that other motherboard and it's booting. There we go, booted right up. Okay, so let's switch over to the other drive. Here it is. Let's see if this one boots. I've already cleaned the heads on it, so hopefully it's functional. It does need a good dusting though. All right. While we wait, I'm just gonna I'm gonna brush some of this dust off into the trash can here. Hey, it's um, actually booting. It is working. There it is, DOS 3.3. Thumbs up, one working drive. Next up, the very dusty one. Turn that on. It's working. Let's uh, get the cleaning floppy ready. It seeked, good sign. Disc failure, of course. 
Ooh, there's a dust bunny on my cleaning disc. I really could use a wider angle lens for this camera because when I'm doing stuff like this on the bench, it's just hard to see exactly what's happening when stuff is strewn about. DOS 3.3 inserted. Sounds like it's booting. I love it. Left for dead. And there's a second working 360K drive. Awesome. Okay, well, the question is, does this IBM clone type card or maybe a real IBM card actually work? So let's hook this up. Oh, floppy drive fail. So this card doesn't work. Interesting. Well, that's a shame. I'm just gonna wiggle this around in the slot. I mean, this motherboard actually is very clean. So I don't think there's a problem with the connectivity. I should, I should have checked the slot connector. Maybe some of that green corrosion had made its way onto this card. Nope, floppy drive failed. Wah, wah, wah. No, nah, this card looks really good. No issues that are, that are visible. None of the chips are hot. No corrosion. Oh, lies. Is that corrosion right there, actually? Yes, it is. All right, so this thing needs a good wash and then maybe a little um, diagnostic for a future video. I just went to the sink and I cleaned off that corrosion. I'm not really seeing a problem, but it could be that one of the traces is just subtly eaten away. So I'll just give it one more quick test. Nope, and it just says floppy drive fail still. Okay, well, if this is an IBM card or a clone of one, I'm sure the schematics are fully available for this. Not to mention all the chips are completely off the shelf. So I'm just gonna take a marker here and I'm going to put an arrow and say corrosion just to help me figure out when I go to diagnose what the problem might be. And I'll draw an X up in the corner here. All right, the next thing I wanna try is this, the hard drive controller. And we'll plug this in and we'll plug it into the hard drive, the Seagate drive. We'll see if this thing boots. It obviously wasn't booting, but it may well boot hooked up to a PC that actually works. Now, when you use a hard drive controller like this, you cannot use a different hard drive controller at the same time. This is only an 8-bit card, right? Just make sure there's no corrosion on this one. No corrosion. And you leave the BIOS set to none. That is because this card already has a ROM BIOS on it. Because inevitably we're going to need a floppy drive, I'm going to plug this known good controller back in here reconnecting the cables to the Seagate drive. Very dusty. All right, we're ready. Place your bets. Put your comments down below. Will this actually turn on? I don't know. Here we go. Hard drive is spinning. That's a good sign. I have no video, though. I think the cable fell off the card. Hey, it's making seeking noises. Hey, I don't know, it's sounding good. It's sounding good. This may actually work. I'm gonna take this floppy disk out. Floppy drive failure. Yes, okay, well, the power is not connected. It was connected. I unplugged it. I'm pretty sure I unplugged it when I um, move this stuff around. Hopefully that's the case. Let's try this again. Comedy of errors here, everyone. Comedy of errors. There it is, Microtech hard drive controller showing up on screen there. The hard drive did make a seek noise, which is good. But will it boot? Oh, ho, ho. Oh, it worked! It worked! It booted! 
Oh, it's such an ancient hard drive. IBM PC DOS 3.10, 1985. Well, I've locked the focus and <laughs> let's poke around on the hard drive. Oh, there's like nothing on here. Now, Config says has a date of 1999. Someone really accessed this thing in 1999? We got PC Tools and Norton on here. All right, Central Point Software 1989. So someone obviously put this thing on here kind of late in the game. And we have Norton as well. It's probably like Norton Utilities. Oh, it's just Norton Commander. Uh, kind of boring. We got version 1.0 from 1986. Pretty old. And I think Norton Disk Doctor is on here as well. There it is. The Norton Disk Doctor. Doctor is in. Uh, for some reason, the floppy drive light is just on solid. I don't have the cable on backwards. And it is connected to the drive correctly. Weird. And Norton Disk Doctor, for whatever reason, is just hanging up. Uh, let's just see if this thing actually boots the floppy disk. Oh no, the drive seeked, so I think it's okay. No, it's booting off the disk right now, so disk is working. I guess something accessed the disk and just left it in a running state. Anyhow, how cool that this 20 meg hard drive totally, totally works. Okay, so good, confirmed working stuff. We have a working hard drive, that's a check. I'll need to run the hard drive on spin right just to let it run overnight, make sure it's totally working properly. Ideally, before I shut this off, I should have parked the heads. I'm just gonna write on here that this is a 360K. I'm already sideways here, it's a little awkward. So this controller works. I'm gonna draw a tick mark on this ceramic package here. Next up, let's give this card a test here. This video card that has 64K of RAM on it. What is this exactly? Let's see if we can figure that out. Uh, that's not gonna work in that slot because um, this needs to go into an 8-bit slot due to this lower edge here. But this motherboard has a compatible slot. Out comes the VGA card, of course. In with this, which of course is the RGB to HDMI, because this will work with pretty much everything. Plug the RGB to HDMI into a power bank. I don't know, you don't, you can obviously plug it into a, any old power supply. I just find it easier to do it this way. Switch the monitor to HDMI, there it is. Okay, I think we are ready. Turn this on and see what we get. Okay, we're getting some flashing on the screen, which would imply this is in the wrong mode here. I'm pretty sure this is MDA, so let's switch this to Hercules. Yeah, okay. So this is some kind of monochrome card. Why? It's so weird that it's got so much RAM on it. Hey, you know what's happening on this floppy drive? I just had floppy drive fail. Look at this, when I push on this, it starts spinning. This is like a flaky connection here. So you know what? Maybe that other hard drive or floppy controller was actually good. Yeah, this is a flaky, flaky connection. Okay, so I need to write, I don't know, I'll put an F on here. That's not gonna help me, is it? <laughs> if I push down on the power connector, it does work. So I might have falsely accused that floppy controller of not working when the reality is it's just the disk drive has a bad or dodgy power connector. So there it is, it booted up. As I was saying, every monochrome, every video card that's not the IBM one has a slightly different video output on it. And for the RGB to HDMI, it's adjusted. The profile is set up for basically the monochrome card from IBM or the Hercules card. So you have to go in there and adjust the profile to get it to work perfectly with one of these cards. But Right now it's working. I mean, it's cropping off the edges and stuff, but clearly we see we have an image there and I know it's it's a monochrome image. I'm gonna swap out this floppy drive. I'll just put a note on here to say that I have to uh, fix the bad power connector. Probably just needs to be re-soldered or something like that. No big deal. 
Let's get the other one out. I think this was the A drive, the one that's on the bench here. So it was the B drive that had the flaky connector on it. And let's go back to the other floppy controller, the one I accused of being bad. It did have some corrosion, which I probably should clean up. I do have to use a different cable because it's got edge to edge connection. Okay, let's try again. Oh, it does work. Thing was falsely accused in with a bootable disc. All right, it does work. Sorry about that controller. I need to uh, use a little IPA to take that off. Still could clean up that corrosion on the back a little bit better. I was like, what happened? Where's the prompt? Well, that's because, of course, it's cut off. It's working. It's working just fine. Okay, mode CO80. Oops. Mode CO80. Let's see if I can switch to color mode. Invalid parameter. So this is definitely not a color card. It must be Hercules compatible. If I recall, Hercules video cards had 64K of RAM because there were multiple high-res pages of bitmap graphics. I think that's what the deal was with all of this. Here we go with the tick mark down here to say it works. All right, the next card is this one, which we know is a color graphics with printer card. So let's give this one a test. Oh, it's got to go into this 8-bit compatible slot again. But using this card here won't be a problem because this RGB to HDMI, it supports monochrome and CGA without an issue. So I'll just switch that over. There it is in color and everything. We're looking good. It needs some tweaking in the RGB to HDMI. Just it's got a little bit of shimmering going on. Otherwise it looks okay. Now, one thing I'm curious about, is this one of those CGA cards that when you do a DIR, you scroll, does it cause flickering? Ugh, display switch set incorrectly. Yeah, I know, CGA, there you go. Now it's set correctly. So the earliest CGA cards from IBM, when you did DIR, they would flicker due to why is it telling me the display switch is incorrect still? Weird. It's definitely a CGA card. And it is set for CGA 80, so could be that this particular BIOS doesn't fully support CGA. Oh, it, it flickers. Duh, look at that. See that flicker? Yep. Oh, I just don't like that at all. And really it's because these early CGA cards, and I don't know if this is one of them, had RAM that if you tried to scroll while the screen was on, you'd get static, something like that. The original IBM card was like that. I, you know, later cards weren't, and yet they still have that flashy BIOS. Some of the later CGA cards, they ignore the BIOS code that tries to blank the screen during scrolling because that's the BIOS itself for CGA is in the motherboard. It's not on the card. So they just ignore that. So you don't get the flicker. But on this one, you get the flicker. Which is maybe there's a hardware mod to stop it from doing that. And I'd have to run the CGA compatibility suite to find out if this thing has the static problem or not. But this is definitely a working CGA card, just a very dusty one. So it gets the old tick mark gets and I'm gonna write CGA here oops CGA all right the floppy controller I erased that X that was on here just a little 99% IPA took it right off so it gets a tick mark instead to say that it works I'll leave that this uh, corrosion mark on the back here just so I can try to clean that up later or, or whatever but it's cool to have a original IBM or at least a clone version of the floppy controller and then this card here, this RAM expansion card, 
Well, we can't obviously plug this in here to expand the RAM, not as an 8-bit card, but, you know, it, let's just try it. Let's see what happens. I really want to know if it shows up with a BIOS on here. And obviously the serial parallel should work. The clock, there's already a clock on here, obviously, but this clock will be at a different base IO. So it should not interfere. So let's just give this a try. See what happens. I just realized no floppy drive controller, but I'm actually gonna switch over to 1.44 megabyte drive so I can boot up into check it off a high density disk. Okay, booting up. Check it should reveal on that's on this disk. Oh, whoa, 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 look at this. PMI fast card for page frame hexadecimal address A800, page register hexadecimal address 0258. I wonder what that is, 258. And then program ROM hexadecimal address D000. No system found a boot. Place diskette and try again. Looking in the memory map, I'm seeing the adapter ROM here, D000 to D400. And if we hit enter, yes, copyright thesis memory products, 1985. I think one issue is it was trying to map itself to A1000, which is the VGA RAM. So this card's probably not fully compatible with uh, VGA cards. Anyhow, I did a little looking online and I found this, there's a picture of the card with the manual. That definitely looks like it. Now this is some kind of eBay listing, I guess. This worth point, which I gotta say is such an annoying website, but I guess it's nice. It shows a picture here. Multifunction memory card. Looks like it can hold two megs of RAM, real-time clock, parallel serial, and a game port. So that's what that, well, that's what this person thinks that is. And there was also a post on VCF where one of the users had the disc and they actually pulled the utilities off. I still don't fully understand. Uh, he says, this is great, I got this card working. Looks like this user here has put something like the PDF from the manual or something on Google Drive. Let's quickly take a look. Oh no, it was taken down. I wish people would upload stuff to archive.org. Ah. Oh. If these links work, oh, you have to sign in. Anyhow, so yeah, kind of interesting. I, If you know about this card and you have an idea why it's got ROMs on here, like what possibly could they do? I have plenty of other cards like this that have multi IO RAM, clock, whatever for XTs. They don't have ROMs. There is no need for a ROM on them. So what exactly is this card doing with its ROMs? That's what I'm curious about. And right before I end the video, here is the motherboard. I gave it a wash, so it's looking a lot cleaner. It's not dry enough yet to try, but I'll try to do a, I don't know, like a repair, I suppose, on this. I have an idea of what to try to see if I can figure out what's wrong with this thing. Maybe possible. No schematics, of course, for this thing, so it's not gonna be easy, but uh, might be kind of fun. So yeah, watch for that in the future. And I guess that is gonna be it for this clone XT out of all the parts, only the motherboard didn't work. Everything else, well, and the floppy drive has that flaky connector. Everything else is, is a survivor. Power supply works, video card worked, this IO card seems to work, floppies, floppy card, hard drive works, which is shocking. Hard drive controller, all pretty amazing. So there we go. If you like this video, you know what to do. And if you didn't, you know what to do and subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. Second channel really helps if you subscribe. And I guess that's it. So thank you very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.